all things considered, it seems clear that the words that the words range is more than a pure covering. And Paul could not have been thinking this as he says, the woman's hair again is given to her as a covering signaling a link between hair and the testicle usage of parabolion. Martin makes it clear that Paul here could be using the word in linkage to the sexual organ thoughts of his day, especially that of a woman. With the quote earlier regarding men's body hair, it would make sense then why Paul would say, does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, is it a disgrace to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. Welcome to the Belfast Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Byler. This week, Daniel and I have a very interesting discussion, continuing our theme of time and place affecting the communication in the Bible. We are discussing the not very controversial patches, passage at all of 1 Corinthians 11, 2-16. This is rife with speculation about what exactly Paul means here. This is the head coverings passage. Now, I will say this. I, the impetus for the paper, uh, we go through a paper I wrote a couple semesters ago, exegeting this passage. The impetus for writing about this passage was a podcast episode by Heiser on the Naked Bible podcast over the passage itself, going through one of the sources I used for the paper. But that source was so interesting, the podcast episode was so interesting, that I figured let's just talk about this whole passage because I want to dig into this some more. So I will link that episode down below. Um, he talks about this in some more depth in uh, Reversing Hermon, which is one of his one of the few books he's written that I haven't read. So whenever I get there, I can talk about it some more. But I figured this is a... I, and I go through and I just exegete the whole passage, kind of bring out some of the themes and, and what we can draw from it, from Paul's communication... Uh, so if you want to read, I have Daniel read the passage in the beginning. If you want to read it yourself, go ahead. Um, I'll also say this. Uh, one of the things that Daniel and I talk about is modesty, dressing modestly. It is one of Paul's themes in the passage. Um, keep in mind what we're talking about, what he's talking about, has to do with men and women, I would say specifically husbands and wives, in the church, during worship, in a service. How do you conduct yourselves? How do you dress? All of these things. And Paul's basic point is, you wouldn't show up to church naked, would you? So, without further ado, let's get into the passage. So, as we've been talking about time, place, communication, we see in Walton's example here that the time and place of the context of what is going on in the Hebrew Bible, what is going on in the theological communication around the ancient world and even in the Israelite world are baked into what is happening in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And so being able to put ourselves in a time and place in our proper in the proper ordering of creation is very important. And being able to put that story in its time and place to see what the text is attempting to communicate to us is also very important. And this doesn't only happen in the Old Testament. It is right it is rife through the whole Bible. And there are many ways in which time, place, understanding and communication all coalesce to bring about certain things in the Bible, things being communicated and things that are tough to understand as moderners, much like the Genesis story in getting the point that is being made. Now, a great example of this in the New Testament is 1 Corinthians 11, 12 through 16 or 2 through 16 and so to set the table here daniel uh, 
uh, would you mind just reading the passage for us? And then I will bring up my paper and discuss the ways some of the assumptions Paul is working with in his context that inform the way which he communicates. What was that reference again? It's first Corinthians. Yeah. First Corinthians 11, 12 to 16, 12 through 16 or, or two? sorry, two through 16. Okay. Sorry. Said it wrong twice. You have a preferred translation. Uh, ESV. But I think I used NIV in my paper anyway. Right. Uh, either one of those is fine. Okay. Um, this is ESV. Okay. Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I deliver them to you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ and the head of a wife is her husband and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head, but every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head since it is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a wife were not covered, uh, will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman. And all things are from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. For her hair is given to her for a covering. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such patience, nor do the churches of God. Okay. So that's Ooh. the that's the passage. Thanks for having me read that. You're welcome. <laughs> I figured I was about to do a lot of reading, so yeah, no, you're good. I'm just I'm totally messing. You just had me read some very controversial <laughs> statements. So. Well, I'm about to say some stuff that's really controversial. So that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> um we don't shy from that here on the Belfast podcast. Um, okay, so I'll open it this way. Uh, if you've ever seen Amish or Mennonite people, the women always wear a head covering. It's actually kind of like, it's not, it, it's not the same thing as a yarmulke, but it looks kind of like a yarmulke. It's like a bonnet, right? Now, the reason I bring that up because the it, this isn't the reason Jewish males do this, obviously, because men aren't told to cover their head in this passage. But for Amish and Mennonite women, this is the verse that they the passage they use to justify why the women cover their head as a symbol of authority. Now, I think that that is a incorrect, very literal interpretation of the passage that does not take into account the context into which Paul is speaking and the things Paul is assuming that his audience knows. Some of the things that tip your hat to this as you read the passage are, well, I'll point out a few things that will become relevant here in short order. Just, I'll start macro and get smaller so a lot of people want to argue not a lot of people but i've read a few papers where people want to argue about this passage not being by paul at all being a later addition into the letter or being a compilation of other things that he wrote and placed into this section because it doesn't make sense 
for him to break thought of what he's talking about, to then go and talk about the Lord's Supper and the, and the passages that follows this one. I think that that is completely incorrect. I'm out. This goes to N.T. Wright's point a couple of podcasts ago when he said that oftentimes our misunderstandings mm -hmm. of the passage of a passage and our lack of cultural awareness lead us to think, oh, Paul doesn't make any sense here. Mm -hmm. He just had an off day. Yep. And no. only later do we get that information. Oftentimes we actually have the information. We just haven't connected it yet. Mm -hmm. And later a scholar will have this information and the biblical text and they'll put it together and they go, oh, that makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. Why hadn't we ever thought of that before? And the thing that drives me crazy is when people have the natural assumption that the text doesn't make sense. And so they find passages that don't make sense. Like this Instead one. of like this one, instead mm -hmm. of having the natural assumption that the passage, the author, or if, even if you want to say there was a rearrangement, a compiler, like sure. we've, we've argued with the Old Testament as a whole, that the compiler or the author knew what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And you're the ignorant one. Mm -hmm. So, enlightenment. I agree. Part of the reason that I don't think that this assumption that either Paul didn't write this or the compiler of the letters of Paul put this in a place, but it doesn't make sense. And therefore is a weird tangent that he makes that we shouldn't think about at all or shouldn't. And this is why they do it. They do it to dismiss the passage. Because they think it has um, demonstrable overtones of patriarchy, which I don't think it does either. We can talk about that in a second. Yeah. But if you just look at the flow of 1 Corinthians as a letter in and of itself, we'll start from, well, six, I'm just going with the big headings of the chapters here that the translators have put in for us to help us make sense of what is going on. Just even by those, I think we can make sense or some sense of what Paul is going for. Chapter six talks about lawsuits, sexual immorality. Seven talks about principles for marriage. We'll talk about that way more in a second. Eight makes a, in talking about living as you're called, living within the principles that God has given us to avoid food sacrifice from idols or to partake in them, whichever be your discretion right because of the power that the idols or the gods no longer have is part of his major point in that passage he alludes to that here as well by the way <clears throat> chapter 10 skipping nine chapter 10 goes on to talk about uh, doing all things for the glory of god at the end of chapter 10 actually i'll i'll skip that part um but he talks about doing all things for the glory of christ and then now he's talking about verse 11 or chapter 11 verse 1 is be imitators of me as i am of christ then there's a section break here he goes on to talk about head coverings switching subjects then he talks about the lord's supper but the ways in which he talks about the lord's supper at the end of chapter 11 here are about order i'll just read chat verse 17 but in the following instructions do i do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. Okay. Paul just stopped a conversation about head coverings and proper unity in the worship service. Don't forget, he's talking... Every man, verse 4, who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head covered, her head uncovered, dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. Okay. Paul isn't talking about the function of women in everyday society with the head coverings. He's talking about how they partake in communion and 
in communion, I mean like community as a church body and how they express the things that the Lord has given to them. Okay. Same thing. He's going on making the same point in a different way in the next section about the Lord's Supper. Chapter 12 and 13. Maybe some of the most famous passages of 1 Corinthians. Chapter 12 is all about spiritual gifts and unity. One body, many members. What is chapter 11, 12 through 16, if not spiritual gifts in unity and order and all of 11 and the Lord's Supper? And then chapter 13, the love chapter, if I have all of these things but don't have love, I have nothing. So love seems to be the superordinate ethic, let's say to all of these things he's talked about for at least the previous two to three chapters. I don't think Paul is having an off day in 1 Corinthians 11, 12 through 16. Not at all. I think, and hopefully you will too, that he is going to make perfect sense. Not sense in our minds necessarily, but sense in his mind. All these things are connected. It's all about unity and worship and the service and the body of the believers when they come together and express those things in a setting where everyone is there. Paul wants the Corinthians, the church in Corinth, to have unity, to be together, and to be ordered properly. Okay, big picture. That's the macro of what's going on in this passage. Some micro things to keep in mind. Paul is not talking about men and women. He is, but he's more specific than that. Wives and husbands. Okay. Wives and husbands. An order within the marriage and how that is expressed specifically in a worship context. Because otherwise, why would he make the comparison to Adam and Eve? I think he makes it not to make a within all comparison of all men and all women. Adam and Eve were married. Same thing in every word that's used in this passage of husbands and wives. Judge for yourself, is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach that if a man wears long hair, is it a disgrace to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is to her glory. Now, though, in that phrase, in that verse, he uses men and women, but he's speaking of what he sees to be a natural reality for all men and all women. But as far as the head coverings go and the function of worship, it is wives and husbands. Time out real quick. Go ahead. Um, I'm not sure, I haven't looked at the Greek of this passage, but in the Hebrew and the Greek both, the word for husband and the word for man and the word for wife and the word for woman are actually the same. Okay. And so it's interesting to me. That I mean, it's you, the translators? The translators are making very deliberate decisions about which word I'm assuming, right? Like I said, I haven't looked at the passage. There are mm -hmm. actually different words there, there usually are multiple words for like human, like you've got Adam and you've got Ish, mm -hmm. which is like humanity, man, or mm -hmm. man, husband um, in Hebrew. Um, and you've got some equivalents to that in, in Greek as well with mm -hmm. um, Anthropos and Andra. But um, regardless, it's interesting that the translators are probably making decisions here about what is what. And so you could very easily translate that itself as husband and wife too. Mm -hmm. Or you can translate the whole thing as wife or um, woman, man. But I think context obviously is informing them that this is a conversation about married people in the church. Mm -hmm. which is important to keep in mind because regardless we'll, we'll of, get to that when he talks about yeah, symbol of authority exactly and um and so 
I don't think they're making choices, right? But I don't say that to say, oh, they're making bad choices. I'd say mm-hmm. that to say, no, they're making well-informed choices. But it's interesting to, just to keep in the back of your mind that all of these words have like distinguished parallels and they're, they're riffing off of each other. And so paying attention to the way Paul is using them, I think is very important. Yep. I mean, and, and Paul, knowing that that's in the Greek behind it's, it is mm-hmm. it's good. And it's very evident that Paul is doing wordplay here about yes, head exactly. coverings. Husband is the head of the wife, all yes. of this stuff, right? He's, he's being a little bit poetic. <clears throat> okay. And what I want to... Tr- particularly draw our attention to in this passage here is verse 14. Does not nature, and Daniel emphasized this, does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair is a disgrace to him, but if a woman has long hair, it is for her glory. For her hair is given to her for a covering. Her hair is given to her for a covering. Not the head covering is given to her to cover her hair. Her hair is given to her for a covering. So obviously there's a lot of questions about, okay, what is Paul's, why does Paul want women to have long hair? And why is Paul against men having short hair or men having long hair, but women can have long hair, but women shouldn't have short hair and men should keep their hair short and not grow it long. What's this whole thing? Why does it matter how long your hair is? That should be one of the ultimate questions we ask of the passage because Paul's really obsessed with hair length. And then from that, women covering their heads in worship and when they do things in worship. So for all you who want to say that women aren't involved in what happens in the church. Well, I was actually going to point that out. Paul because it, is obviously not against it. it actually he just wants ex- them to be in their proper place. Yeah, it explicitly says that um, when a woman, when a woman, what was it, preaches or prophesies in mine, the ESV? Mine says uh, praise. Praise. Okay. Yep. Praise or prophesies. Every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. Prophesy in um, doesn't necessarily even have the same connotation as prophesied would now yep. it's usually to bring a an edifying word to the group mm-hmm. um theoretically prompted by the holy spirit and i say theoretically not that i don't believe that it could be hashtag used to be or still am pentecostal um <laughs> but um the I, I say that because um it wasn't always necessarily some like magical speaking in tongues moment. It was some, sometimes it was just, this is what I feel like is best in the situation kind of thing. And so we need to be careful how we think about that term prophecy, but Mm -hmm. yes, it's implying that women are active participants in the leadership production, speaking, preaching, prophesying, corrective role in the congregation. Mm -hmm. Paul just wants them to be literally clothed properly or present themselves with modesty, let's say, even though people might cringe at that, rightfully so, that phrase. Um, But there is certainly something about modesty. And again, we'll get to the um, symbol of authority here. So I might have to actually talk about Genesis 6. But anyway, uh, I want to talk for a second. I have a little section here in my paper. So for those of you who are curious, uh, my paper was for last semester for my hermeneutics class, and I titled the paper, um, Paul's Hair Testicles, Hierarchies, and Modesty, an Investigation of 1 Corinthians 11, 2 through 16. Now, also full disclosure for my influences on this paper, I wrote this paper because I actually ended up listening to an episode of the Naked Bible podcast where Heiser goes through the passage and uses the paper, a paper that I used heavily in this, in my own paper by, um, let me make sure I get his name right. 
um, Troy Martin. It's a 2004 paper. <clears throat> and Martin's paper is titled Paul's Argument from Nature for the Veil in 1 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15, a testicle instead of head covering. So I heard Heiser's episode on that talking through Goodacre's paper about this passage, helping us make sense of it in its context in the world in which Paul inhibit, inhabited and what probably was going through his head when he talked about these head coverings for women and why these phrases are so elusive to us now. Now, I have a bunch of other supporting scholars that I use that are on the same train, and I can talk about some of those in a minute. So it wasn't purely just because of Martin's paper that I wrote this, but it was my impetus to investigate this passage. But I want to start with what I use as my, in my third uh, section here, it's called total transfer, totality transfers of interpretation. And this will go back to what we were talking about with Genesis creation physical cosmology versus theological rendering of the text. I say, Paul's strange words regarding head coverings in 1 Corinthians have been fodder for flawed interpretation, not because of tyrannical intention, but because Paul's words are indeed so strange. An excellent example of this would be the response to the Jesus movement in the 60s due to the trend of men growing their hair long. This is, and this is a quote, from Gordon, uh, from Gordon Fee and Douglas Stewart's book, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. They say, or take the problem many traditional churchgoers had with the Jesus people in the late 1960s and early 70s. Long hair on boys had already become the symbol of the hippie movement in the 1960s. For Christians to wear that symbol, especially in light of 1 Corinthians 11, 14, does not nature itself teach you that for a man to wear long hair is degrading to him seems like an open defiance of God himself. Yet most of those who quoted that text against the youth culture allowed for Christian women to cut their hair short, despite verse 15, did not insist on women's heads being covered in worship, nor never considered that nature came about by very unnatural means, a haircut. And then later they say, something that Walton said in his talk to another quote from their book. You will recall from chapter one that we set out as a basic rule, the premise that text cannot mean what it never could have meant to, the, to its author or to his or her readers. And then I say, we must keep in mind how these words of Paul would have hit his audience in Corinth. Pause. I think that's a really important point. And as I was reading your paper, um, I actually highlighted that quote. A text cannot mean what it never could have meant to its intended audience. That's not to say that we can narrow down exactly what it means to this one specific thing, though I think we can make very good and well-informed attempts at that. But in this example and in the Genesis example that we just covered, it's important to keep in mind that a text cannot mean what it never could have meant to that intended audience. Very like fundamental principle of interpretation, I think. Agreed. Part of the whole reason I wrote the paper. My next section is entitled Parabolion as, text, as testicle. Here we go. And where this comes from is in verse 15. Paul says, for long hair is given to her as a covering. And the word in Greek there for covering is parabolion. This is what Martin's paper is all about. Until recently, Paul's use of the word parabolion was not under much study. It only has a few other occurrences in scripture and the Septuagint naturally. It appears in Hebrews 1.12. And here the writer is quoting Psalm 102, 25 through 27 when talking about God's judgment, saying, like a robe, you will roll them up, like a garment, they will be changed. That's from Hebrews 1.12. Mm -hmm. 
All of the other uses of the term in the Septuagint have to do with coverings, garments, clothing. And this is true of the meaning of the word, but the semantic range is wider than just a covering garment. And it makes little sense to be a cloth covering to Paul in verse 15, because he says, for long hair is given to her as a covering. Paul cannot be referring to a cloth covering over the hair because he says a woman's hair is her covering. This is essentially important in understanding the semantic usage that Paul is going for here. To continue, I introduced Troy Martin's paper from 20, 2004, Paul's argument from nature for the veil in 1 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15, a testicle instead of a head covering. The title is striking, to be sure, and Martin is tipping his hat to where he is headed, but it is important to see how he builds the case for the use of parabolion outside of the biblical material, because, as we all know, it will enrich our reading of the Bible. Martin makes the majority of the case for parabolion's use in Greek medical text from Hippocrates and Aristotle, although he starts in a more interesting place, mythology. And here's a Here's one of the quotes from, Good, from Martin's paper. Euripides uses Parabolion in reference to a body part. He cast Hercules as complaining, after I received my bags of flesh, which are the outward signs of puberty, I received labors about which I shall undertake to say what is necessary. A dramatic translation of the first clause would be, after I received my testicles, which are the outward signs of puberty. In this text from Euripides, the term parabolion refers to a testicle. In the medical text of Hippocrates, Mar or, uh, Martin quotes as saying, Martin quotes Hippocrates, who says, hair grows only on the head of prepubescent humans because semen is stored in the brain and the channel of the body and the channels of the body have not yet become large enough for reproductive fluid to travel through the body. At puberty, secondary hair growth in the pubic area marks the movement of reproductive fluid from the brain to the rest of the body. So semen is stored near or where hair grows, according to Hippocrates. Keep in mind, Hippocrates, the Hippocratic Oath, okay? It's not like he was stupid. It is important to keep in mind the connection between hair and reproductive ability, as this is the link needed if Paul is indeed talking about hair for women as a testicle, a place where the semen of a man is stored. To this end, Martin quotes Aristotle, Aristotle, who says this, during intercourse, semen has to fill all the hollow hairs on its way from the male brain to the genital area. Thus, men have hair growth on their face, chest, and stomach because semen travels, to stop the quotation for a second, logically, because semen travels where the hair is. So there has to be channels for all the semen to travel for the hair to go down to the testicles and eventually deposited somewhere else to continue. Um, I'll back up just a bit. Thus, men have hair growth on their face, chest, and stomach. A man with hair on his back reverses the usual position of intercourse. A man with long hair retains much or all of his semen, and his long, hollow hair draws the semen towards his head area but away from his genital area, where it should be ejected. Therefore, 1 Corinthians 11.14 correctly states that it is a shame for a man to have long hair, since the male nature is to eject rather than retain semen. Now, of course, the end there is Martin talking himself about the 1 Corinthians and Paul's words about the shame for men to have long hair, but that only makes sense if we understand hair as part of the reproductive function, and if a man, again, 
A man with long hair retains much or all of his semen, and his long hollow hairs draw the semen towards his head area, but away from his genital, genital area, where it should be ejected. That's why it's a shame for a man to have long hair. This is also, if you recall, unmentioned in the previous example of those who, who rejected men having long hair because Paul said it was a shame, but didn't talk about why women should have long hair or shouldn't, sh shouldn't cut their hair. One more quote from Martin, just to make the point that this wasn't only in ancient Greece that they had this conception, but later in church history. If one were to think that it was only the outside of the church and possibly Paul who held this view in the church, they would be wrong. Tertullian, an early church father, also held this view. And Martin quotes Tertullian saying this. Tertullian draws an analogy between prepubescent children and Adam and Eve who were naked before they became aware of genital differentiation. Afterward, though, Tertullian notes, quote, they each, marked the intel they each marked the intelligence of their own sex by a covering. Noting the growth of the pubes over the female pedendum, Tertullian exports, let her whose lower parts are not bare have her upper parts likewise covered. Okay. Interesting, Tertullian. To go on Martin's quote, Tertullian's analogy and exhortation presume that hair becomes a functioning part of a young woman's genitalia at puberty, similar to the way testicles begin functioning at puberty as part of the male genitalia in facilitating the dissemination of semen. Much more could be said of Martin's art end quote. Much more can be said of Martin's argument here regarding Parabolion as he does in response to Goodacre's article because Mark Goodacre wrote a quote does Parabolion mean testicle in 1 Corinthians 11.15 which he's refuting. All things considered it seems clear that the words that the words range is more than a pure covering and Paul could not have been thinking this as he says the woman's hair again is given to her as a covering signaling a link between hair and the testicle usage of parabolion. Martin makes it clear that Paul here could be using the word in linkage to the sexual organ thoughts of his day, especially that of a woman. With the quote earlier regarding men's body hair, it would make sense then why Paul would say, does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, is it a disgrace to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. Paul, again, is appealing to nature and the natural usages of hair according to his time. Any comments? It's the only interpretation that I've ever encountered that makes sense of this passage in any meaningful way. Because even if you take the super conservative route in the sense that women have to have their hair covered men are the absolute authority over them, like all of that stuff, it still doesn't make sense of the other challenging portions of the passage, like the fact that... Um, Nature tells us these things. They, yeah. Like what, the what's disgrace and honor of hair length. Yeah, it, it doesn't make any sense unless you have this understanding. And so it seems abundantly obvious to me that that's what's going on. And again, I've said it twice in the paper and I'll say it again. Paul in, in that, in the final verses of the section in 15 can't be referring to covering as fabric yeah. because he says her hair is given to her as a covering. Yeah. The hair is the covering. The hair is the parabolion. The hair it's the testicle. The hair is where the semen is kept. Which is why she is to cover it, right? Is because it's perceived in their culture to be a sexual organ. Mm -hmm. And as part of, and as, as a statement of reproductive, let's say, viability. 
Yeah. Yeah. And so um, just like in our cultures today, in most cultures today, I'll say, parts of the body that are associated culturally, whether that's scientific or not, with reproduction are typically the parts of the body that are culturally commended for being covered, Mm -hmm. right? And so it makes perfect sense that if that's their perception, then, because it never made sense to me why the hair of a woman should be covered, right? That's never been like a particular stumbling block to use a loaded term, right? Mm -hmm. In our culture, hair is just, Sure, Here's a nice good. accessory. Yeah, but it's not like the thing that's going to you cause know. you to stumble. Yeah, exactly. And so it's not like cleavage. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's not. And it's, um, I mean, it's it's like the my friends and I used to joke in high school about you know, um, our, our school's dress code meant that girls had to have their shoulders covered. Yeah, and we were just like what what like oh dumb shoulders like we used yeah. to always say that because it's it's like it's not it's like cup, hair coverings right it's not going to cause us to stumble and so mm-hmm. why is that why is that a thing but this makes it make perfect sense and notice paul and the holy spirit aren't using our understandings of reproduction science and reproduction it's just not god isn't this is something that we didn't play specifically but this is something maybe we did i don't remember well i've watched the video like three times in the past five days so yeah um but wallen talks about god not updating their understanding yeah holy spirit isn't saying no paul that's actually not how hair functions I'm sorry to tell you but like write it like this because well, 2,000 years be... later, they'll understand. So write it like this, that way. Yep. Not, not that the community that you're writing to, that you're trying to address problems in can understand. Write it so that 2,000 years later, they'll understand. Exactly. That's so arrogant to assume that. Yeah. yeah. This makes perfect sense of the passage in a way that no other exegesis ever has. And it also implies very up front the ability and the natural function of women in the church as teachers as vocal prayers and prophesiers Mm -hmm. which is also interesting too that we i don't know we can't harmonize that in other passages without a little bit more information right okay i want to I quote more from Gordon Fee here, um, which is, I quoted from him earlier in the book about, uh, oh, where was it? Uh, Gordon Fee and Douglas Stort's book, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. Um, I want to read a little bit here from the passage about, um, I guess I'll I'll read a little bit more before this too. just so that we can actually get, I can keep my promises. This is a section, the next section, Paul's hierarchy for marriage. I say modern, modern, moderners, modern, that's wrong. Modernists may shiver at Paul's language regarding the nature of hair and the thoughts of the biological roles of men and women. How much more true is that statement six months later? But he would but he was also a product of his day, and it would be illogical to say that his view of nature does not impact his view of the roles of men and women. Mixed in with Paul's talk of the nature of reproduction is the theological foundation for the order that must take place in the church and in marriage. While in the middle of this passage, while the middle of this passage deals with the creation order of men and women, it is clear that Paul's directives of head coverings and order are directed towards the marital relationship. 
verse verse three makes this clear, but I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. First Corinthians eleven three. This verse is essential to the hierarchy Paul's Paul desires for married couples at Corinth. The husband is to follow Christ, loving her as Christ loved the church. The wife is to follow her husband as he follows Christ, all participating in the example of Christ, who did the will of his father. Feminist writers have argued about whether Paul is playing up the power of men here, using it to domineer the women in their lives, but he subverts this in verses 11 and 12. And he says, nevertheless, and the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made for man, so man is now born of woman. And all things are from God. It is also worth pointing out Paul's play with the term head here, talking about authority. Um, pause. Go ahead. Real quick, I think that's that section's worth taking a breath on. Um, because what Paul's saying there, right? I mean, you can get confused. Oh, well, he still said that men are head of the woman and yada, 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 right? But what he's, what Paul's setting up there is this circular domino effect of women being the thing that brings men and men being the thing that women came from, right? And so there's this, this constant, like, this cycle of dependency on each other, mm -hmm. which if you'll remember is Paul's point, not just in this passage, but in the passages before and in the passages after we all need each other. We are to be unified with each other. We are to care and love for each other. It is ultimate. Like if you're taking the arguments to step up towards first Corinthians 13, that's his ultimate point, right? And so this is not to say that men rule over women because they're the head. This is to say we are mutually benefiting each other in the world. Dependent role on each other. We're dependent on each other. We need each other to exist. Otherwise, the other does not exist. And, and so to, to say then that one gets to rule over the other completely misses the point that Paul is making. It's not authority in a domineering sense at all. This is mutual dependence mm -hmm. in love with each other. So I don't know. I, I thought that was worth pausing on and maybe this will um, kind of help give a preliminary treatment to um, the airbrushes we've made and avoidances we've made for uh, authority of <laughs> authority of men, women in ministry. Yeah, yeah. Well, obviously I'm very pro women in ministry. Otherwise I wouldn't have framed the paper how I have. Yeah. <clears throat> it is also worth pointing out Paul's play of words with head here, talking about authority and the hair on the head throughout the whole passage, but we are getting ahead of ourselves. The major point that Paul is calling for is order, not dominance or domineering. Order. They're not the same thing. Order and the worship and within the marriage relationship in the church in Corinth. Here's where I, I quote from Gordon Fee here a little bit. This is the next section. Hair as sex organ, an argument for modesty. Remember the train of thought thus far. Paul's desire for unity, the medical conception of the day, and the desire for order and worship and marriage are essential to correctly interpreting the middle section of the passage regarding hair length, verse 5 through 6. 5 through 6, making an argument for desired hair length, and Fee's commentary on Corinthians says, also, quote, also in each instance, the argument seems aimed specifically at the woman and rests squarely on her head. Again, more wordplay. Fee is absolutely right, although it seems specifically to do with wives, not just women generally, Paul says, but every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. <laughs> 
since it is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. Why? Because then she couldn't, it wouldn't be as much of a signal of reproductive function or availability. That's why if you, don't, if you don't cover it, you cut it short. But since it is a disgrace for a wife to cut her hair or to shave her head, let her cover her head. Also time out right there. Uh, sorry, oh, yeah. Go I'm, I'm going to make a point about marriage. Yeah. To, to the argument I'm making here, modesty, marriage, order, hierarchy. First of all, we all submit ourselves to certain things, whether we want to or not. It's a great Peterson quote. You're sacrificial whether you want to be or not. You submit to something whether you want to or not. But I think the other side of the coin here to this argument is if you're not a wife, you don't have the same kind of submission in this sense that a wife has. Because you don't have the same relationship. I would be very worried if your wife had the same relationship with you and with other men be called infidelity. Yeah. Well, and there's a reason I wear this, right? Is to preemptively signal to people, Hey, not available. Right. I have, you could call, I mean, it's, the word submission is so semantically overloaded. Mm -hmm. It's mind boggling. But there are many behaviors that I do not engage in, you could say, in a submissive sense, mm -hmm. because I made a covenant commitment to my wife, right? And that is the, the same for her. And so... To imply that there's no, like, like you said from Peterson, there's, there's all sorts of submission tied up in this, right? And to think that I lord over my wife, man, if, if any of y'all met my wife, you, you'd know, right? That's not the case at all, right? But we submit to each other to take mm -hmm. care of each other, to respect each other, and to, um, and to, to, to love each other properly, right? And, and to um, maintain the sanctity of our relationship. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's part of it. I mean, there are also things that, ways that works in friendships too, right? D depending Dude, in on some the, way, like, we're doing this for more than one reason, but like, at some sense, when we agree to have these conversations, I'm submitting my time to you. Yeah. I'm saying this is important enough to do together that like we're going to sacrifice and submit other things, put them lower on the totem pole, so to speak, to do, to pursue this thing. Yeah. I, and I mean, to see a world in which there is no submission is to like Lewis, to not see the world be, or, and to not have relate. And to act, well, it's, it's not to not see the world. It's to not actually have relationships. Yeah. Because if you think about it, that's what makes a lot of people mad in any relationship is, hey, you at, what do we say? You're acting like you don't care about me. You're not willing to submit some time to spend it with me. You're not willing to submit things you would like to talk about and you always talk about what you, whatever you want, but you never listen to me. You're not submitting silence to me so that I can then speak, right? And I'm trying to keep using the word submit to show you all the other ways in which it works. It's yeah. not just the overly semantic loaded, well, you just, you know, are there on your knees with your face to the ground and you never say anything back and you cower. That's not submission. Well, uh, it is a certain form of submission. I would argue in almost all contexts, it is a bad kind of submission. Yeah, it, to see that as the, well, I keep, I guess, flirting around this idea 
as we have conversations on here, but opportunity cost mm -hmm. is it's a simple concept to do one thing is to choose not to do another thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's the cost of opportunity. So to be on this podcast right now, I'm not eating dinner. I'm not outside hanging out with Bethany, though she's probably studying actually. So I probably wouldn't be doing that anyway, but it's, it's not to do those two things. It's not to run to the store and pick up whatever. It's not to read or study languages, right? Those are all of my opportunity, not even all, those are some of my opportunity costs of being here on this. And so like you, you just made the point, I'm submitting myself to this project and not submitting myself to those projects. In fact, I'm submitting those projects to this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because hierarchy is inherent in decision-making, right? For all of this talk against hierarchy and how evil hierarchy is, it's the only way to actually function in a motivated sense. It's the only, the only way to function in really any sense. Yeah, it's the only thing that leads you to action right, is the prioritization of one thing versus another. That implies submission and not, not in a domineering sense necessarily, but in the, in the sense that all things must be submitted at some point in time. I've said it before, self-control is the attribute most like God. Self-control requires submission of certain things to a higher thing, mm -hmm. period. I'll, I'll let this rest now because we probably have some more things to cover before we need to, but um, I just, yeah, I thought that no, was worth I, on. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, so let's talk for a second about... Um, I'm sorry. I'm skimming real quick to see. No, you're good. Um, let's talk for a second about the really odd phrase in in First Corinthians eleven, seven through eleven. Now, this is a lot more conjecture. I don't have as much scholarly resource on this these few verses themselves, but I have some conjecture and I think I'm in good company, <clears throat> but let's read the, the verses here real quick for a man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man for man was not made for woman, but woman for man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. This is why a wife, because of this hierarchy, this is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Now, all of that seems to make some sense with all the things we've talked about, but why, what is this phrase about the angels? Well, man is the image and glory of God because of how he's described in creation accountants in Genesis 1 26. Let us make man in our image. Woman is the glory of man, according to Paul, because she is created from man, as stated in Genesis 2.22. Woman is then created for, for man because no suitable helper was found fit for him. For Adam, when God brought all the other creatures, no suitable helper was found fit for him when, at, for Adam, when God brought all the other creatures to him. If one was to stop there, it would sound as if, as if though Paul is against women thinking they are less than men, but he makes them, he makes the equality of them clear in verse 12. For woman was, for as woman was made for man, so man is now born of woman and all things are for God. Also, to just drive this point home a little bit more, if Paul's truly drawing from Genesis, then he cannot forget what is said in the verse after the one he just quoted, Genesis 127. So God created mankind in his own image. 
In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Paul is not prohibiting the exercise of women's role in the church. Let us not forget he is calling the modesty when the wives of the congregation pray and prophesy. He is not saying they cannot. The order of things should be right when they participate. Paul is attempting to protect the sanctity of the union in the church and in marriage. If this is not already clear, let us move on to some speculation regarding Paul's odd phrase regarding the angels. You pointed to your wedding ring earlier, and you said, I wear this as a symbol of my submission to my wife. To understand this, oh, okay. It's Craig Keener, someone else who talks about this. He has a commentary on Corinthians. <clears throat> So it's actually a Bible background commentary where he comments on 1 Corinthians 11. And Keener says this, woman's hair was a common object of lust and antiquity. And in much of the Eastern Mediterranean, women were expected to cover their hair. To fail to cover the hair was thought to provoke the male lust as a bathing suit is thought to provoke it in some cultures today. And if you don't like that phrase, provoke male lust, well, you need to think a lot harder about why people dress the way they do on both sides of the aisle, men and women. I'll leave that there. But oh, real, real quick, you should say something on that. I think it's vitally important to understand that what Paul is trying to do is, like you said earlier, pr protect the sanctity of the community and the marriage. Because the marriage and is part of the community. Because the marriage is part of the community. Marriage is regarded as sacred. Mm -hmm. And he's also giving some really good practical advice about how to avoid problems, right? Like if, if I'm going to give someone advice about how to like be a good spouse and or community member mm -hmm. so don't be a jerk by unnecessarily provoking people especially if that's not your intentions mm -hmm. like you said earlier think seriously about the way people dress and the signals that sends intentional or unintentional right because regardless of whether or not making assumptions is good and that's i actually think something that's up for debate um I think that it's very obvious that we all do make assumptions about people mm -hmm. based on the way they present themselves and dress is a key function in that. And so I'm reminded of Peterson's comments on the vice interview about makeup. I don't know if I've seen that. Okay. For those of you who get it, you'll understand the reference, but it's yeah, not worth sidetracking all the way right yeah. now, but yeah. So anyway, I just same kind of thing is going on. Yeah. I, and I just said that to make that point that I think it's important that we not just see Paul as laying down ground rules, but Paul trying to build a community that's healthy and sustainable. Mm -hmm. Right. Paul's trying to protect people. Mm -hmm. Right. Because walking in, walking around downtown in, in my town at night in a provocative outfit by yourself is probably not a good idea. Mm -hmm. regardless of whether or not you should be able to do it safely you probably shouldn't do it right that's not to say anything about your guilt if something bad were to happen that is just to say if you're trying to limit your risk mm -hmm. doing that's not a good way to to go, to accomplish that goal mm -hmm. right so i think paul's doing something very similar here Anyway, mm -hmm. on to the more, angle. more I could say, but yeah. speaking of the angels, symbols of authority, we'll go back to Genesis 6. Genesis 6 1 through 2 says, When man began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, 
the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. Members of God's heavenly council, the sons of God decided to abandon their proper dwelling, as Jude 6 says, and take human, wa- human women as wives, creating the Nephilim. The phrase here is important saw the daughters of man were attractive in reference to the sons of God. It is clear that these women, whether they intended to or not, provoked the lust of the angels. Whether they intended to or not, again, not speaking of their guilt in the, let's say, approach of the angels who abandon their dwelling. But I'm, and again, I'm intentionally using Keener's phrase again to clue you in on the logic I'm trying to draw and why Paul would say for the angels as a, as a logical conception for why head covering is also important in church. Okay. Because again, it's, I'll read this and then I'll make my comment. The symbol of authority is that of marriage and modesty, of being spoken for, as we would say today. It is a similar reason for wearing a wedding ring. It projects to all those around that you are spoken for or unavailable. Paul could be drawing on this with the language of the head covering being a symbol of authority as not to once again provoke the lust of the angels. If the marriage of those in Corinth is to be kept sacred away from immorality and the women want to help with that and being modest in worship, then they should have a symbol of authority, the authority of a husband and a head covering because of the angels. Paul is basically saying, Hey, you know that awful thing that happened to Genesis 6 when the Nephilim came and the Anakim came and they taught us all the ways to destroy ourselves and it led to the flood and it created the Nephilim, which were a big problem for Israel? You know, let's let's try and not have that happen again and make sure that when we are declaring that God is king over all all the earth and over all the powers that we don't then provoke those powers to do what they did before. And I'm using the word provoke because it's Keener's phrase. Maybe entice would be a better word. Um, I think provokes a little too aggressive. Um, But regardless, I think this is kind this is what's going on here. Um, Yeah, I mean, I think it's, like you said, it's the only way I make sense of the passage. Now, again, whether you think Paul's right or his logic is correct or you think our presentation is good enough is a whole other debate, but I'm just trying to draw on time and place. Paul is talking to a church in Corinth in a Greek city that would have thought certain things because of the water in which they swam about hair about reproduction about the medical usages of the day i didn't even use all of good acres quotes about the ways in which these things were thought to be relevant in in uh in those times there's many more um but yeah and we're, again we're not calling for the banishment of women out of ministry or out of practice in the church um i'm not saying you need to cover your shoulders or you know wear a burqa like (laughs) no one would enjoy that so or um, i mean and we're not calling for the opposite either right we're we're just saying that time and place have a have a part to play in the mm-hmm. interpretation and this is an example of time and place being ignored and i would say a lot of bad things happening because of that right mm-hmm. um or a lot of faulty interpretations that have mm-hmm. had large ramifications good or bad coming from that 
right? And if you want to uphold a cultural practice that doesn't actively hurt people, by all means, right? Like, but it, no interpretation that I've encountered of this passage other than this actually makes sense of all of the factors at play in the passage and again, in any coherent way. I am, I, in this paper, I'm just trying to draw what I would see as Paul's logical conclusions to why he says what he says and the meaning he's trying to give to the church in Corinth. Again, whether you agree with Paul or not is another conversation. Whether we uh, agree or would say it the same way is another conversation. I'm just trying to draw these things out because of the time and place in which Paul is writing. I want to real quick just read my conclusion. I say, part of what it means to take the scripture seriously is to take those who wrote it seriously. Back to your quote about Paul assuming that he has something to say. It is vital to remember that the people who produced what is not... It is vital to remember that people who produced what is in our scriptures lived in a particular t- place and time. Wow, I wrote this like six months ago. Um, it is vital to remember that the people who produced what is in our scriptures lived in a particular t- place and time one that had its own ideas about gender, sex, and science. And we have a lot of different ideas now about gender, sex, and science. So these things are changing, whether we want them to or not, whether we think they should or not, or whether they can or not. While our knowledge regarding procreation has greatly increased with modern science, it is easy to forget that these have not been known for all of human history much less almost 2,000 years ago. Paul is not right when it comes to to the idea of his day regarding the usefulness of hair length in human reproduction, but it was enough of a concern to address it with the church at Corinth. Even with this, the reproductive efforts of hair are a secondary concern. The major concern for Paul is the proper participation of wives in the worship service at Corinth, and husbands for that matter. A certain modesty was expected, especially of the wives of the husbands in the church, in the church, okay? He's not talking about all women in Corinth. He's talking about the women in the church. Unity is the ultimate concern for Paul. Unity in the church, unity that comes with proper order and marriage. and in the church. Well, it proves the point that we we made earlier with Genesis 2, right? Is Genesis 1 also, um, is that understanding the, for lack of a better term, scientific understanding of that day as it implies certain things about the passage itself doesn't necessarily mandate that scientific perspective. Mm -hmm. And it also, I wouldn't argue Paul's scientific perspective at all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it it doesn't, I think he's, I think he's wrong. Yeah. And we can, for lack of a better term, prove that he's wrong. Right. But he's not making a point about science. Paul's not being a scientist. Paul's being a theologian a, yeah. and a community builder. Yes. And he's making these points and using those as secondary to uphold his view and yes. his prescription. And his, his attempt to make and sustain a healthy community. Mm-hmm. So it... Um, but as you said earlier, if you don't know about these conceptions of hair in ancient times, the passage, I think, makes no sense. I agree. I've never attempted in my five years of youth ministry to even touch this passage because I didn't know what to do with it until you were like, hey, I read this cool thing. 
I think I'm gonna write a paper on it. And you explained it to me and I was like, oh my gosh, this like, it makes it one of my more enjoyable passages now. Like one of the passages I like to talk about because it very easily illustrates how something can go from being very confusing and making no sense to being very enlightening and actually enriching in my life. Mm -hmm. Right. Because, I mean, we're not saying that these same standards hold now, mm -hmm. but I think you can very easily see the conclusion that Paul is trying to build. And you can take that conclusion for your community and apply it now, mm -hmm. whether or not we do that perfectly is another question, but that is something that I think we're supposed to do. Right. Mm -hmm. Paul is trying to make sure that everyone in the community is protected. Everyone in the community is keeping their word, right. Be it husbands and wives to each other or members of a congregation to each other. And Paul is trying to make sure that, um, <clears throat> that the community functions properly mm -hmm. of itself and in its larger context with the understanding that they had. Okay, how do we take those points and apply them to our lives now? That's a big question one that we won't address here, but it should be apparent that those are the principles to gain from this passage. And if we take this passage and apply it to our lives, it should bear some fruit in that direction. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't have uh, anything else to say. I'll just, I guess, sum like this. It's important to see the Bible in time and place because without it, you lose clarity. Mm -hmm. And so with, with the Genesis example and with this First Corinthians example, they're just two pictures of how that works in both the Hebrew Bible and in our Greek New Testament. And moving forward, I think it's important for both of us, but all, all Christians, right? All of us to take seriously the treatment of our sacred text with this information because not to do so is, I think, significant theological malpractice and can lead to a lot of bad things. Mm -hmm. So we won't have the answers on every passage, but these two passages, I think it's easy to see how these things matter. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you.